Welcome to That's Anita Live, the talk show dedicated to providing emotional healing through sharing to help you create a happier life. I'm Anita, your host, and this week we have author Tiara Nicole in the building. She's a well-known internet influencer. Through her blogging and books, she shares her struggles with that she's overcome with depression, suicide attempts, and a miscarriage. Today, she shares with us how she overcame her obstacles to help you overcome your challenges. Welcome, Nicole, to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Definitely. Your story is hard to believe. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, one thing you can never say about me is that I'm not truthful. So um, everything I've ever said is 100% the raw truth, um, even if it hurts some feelings along the way. Yeah, because in being transparent, mm -hmm. there are always going to be some collateral damage. But Absolutely. They, but they've got to understand that that is a purpose for it, mm -hmm. and it's also a part of helping others heal. Absolutely. Um, actually, when I released my first book, there was a lot of collateral damage. I think more so because I was suffering in silence. Okay. And it was the first time I said, no, this is my experience. Yes. My mm -hmm. experience is valid. Mm -hmm. Regardless of how you felt, it still hurt. And so really sitting down and being truthful yeah. about a lot of the things that I had experienced growing up. Um, and there were some you know, close family and friends that rallied behind me and supported it. And there were some who shied away from the truth and didn't want to really he face it head on. Okay, so let's start from childhood and then work up to where you are now in helping to help others heal and inspire them to move on with their lives versus yeah. staying stuck in their pain. The first time you attempted suicide, you were seven years old. Yes. How did we get there? How did we get there? Um, my first attempt was at seven. Um, I attribute it to my daddy issues that I had, and I didn't know the term for it, of course, at okay. seven, okay. but I was really feeling like I wasn't good enough for my father. Okay. And that's because he was not around? I, I've always known my father. Mm -hmm. He's always popped in and out, okay. and I wanted that consistency. Mm -hmm. And I wanted him to be there first day of kindergarten. And I wanted him to be there for the first heartbreak. And, you know, mm -hmm. all of those experiences. Mm -hmm. And it really boiled down to he had never dealt with his daddy issues. Yeah. And I'm sure we can go even further right. down that, that lineage. Hurt others, exactly. So. Hurt people absolutely hurt yeah, people. Yeah. And when I was seven, I do remember distinctly feeling like, why doesn't he show up? Why isn't he there? Mm -hmm. And I've always, my mom is also a very transparent person. So I've always known my, like my conception story and all of that. So I'm like, you made a conscious decision to create me. Mm -hmm. Why can't you show up? My mother showed up and never stopped showing up. Yeah. Why doesn't my father, who was the active, dis you know, right. determinant mm -hmm. of that decision. So I just couldn't wrap my brain around it. And as I've gotten older and uh, especially when I started uh, studying psychology in undergrad, mm -hmm. I definitely mm -hmm. began to understand, A, hurt people hurt people, mm -hmm. and B, it was more so he didn't know how to show love. Mm -hmm. He didn't know how to be consistent because his, upbr his upbringing um, didn't show him consistency. Okay. So it what happened on the day of, mm -hmm. or how did you get to making the decision that you were going to make that attempt? I don't specifically remember the day of. Okay. Um, I remember how I attempted. Because seven um, is very seven young. Seven is very young. And in my seven-year-old mind, I decided that I was going to hang my head over uh, the bed and let the blood rush, rush down to my head. Okay. And that was how I was going to end it. Okay. And I think it really was just a feeling of worthless. It was a mm -hmm. feeling of not good enough. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was a feeling of, why doesn't he love me? And I had to realize... Um, it wasn't me that was the, the struggle in our relationship. He didn't know how to love. And we're in a, lot, uh, we're in a better place now. <laughs> we're, we're, we're actually doing really but, good now. Okay, but. Seven, did somebody catch you? Did you come out of it and say that was a bad idea? I just don't think I could. Um, I, I consider that God saved me. Okay. Um, because as I was laying over the edge of my bed, I just couldn't follow through. 
Like I, I just couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I started to get dizzy and all of that. Like I just couldn't continue yeah. the act. Yeah. Um, so it was definitely God stopping it. Um, but it was also one of those things where as a seven year old, mm -hmm. you don't really know how to communicate those sorts of things. So with your father popping in and out, mm -hmm. what was it as a child that made you desire his attention more? Because with, with the pattern of him being consistent from your birth up to where we are, which is mm -hmm. like seven, eight years old, mm -hmm. what was it about him that you craved more versus just not accepting? That you know, that's just what it is. Yeah. Right. I because think, somewhere you figured out or you saw it somewhere that this is not how this is supposed to be. You are supposed to be on your job and mm -hmm. you're not. Absolutely. I think I always wanted to be that daddy's girl. Okay. Um, and especially when I was, I am still his only child. And it's like, how could you not get it right yeah. once? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you had one job. <laughs> Um, so I think it was just more so, and you see your friends and your, you know, oh, all of that with yeah, their yeah, amazing yeah. father-daughter relationships and always wanting that okay. and feeling like, well, why don't I deserve that? You know, mm -hmm. then it, that's what kind of led to the self-worth conversation. Like, what is it about me that makes me so difficult to love? Was there ever a neighborhood dad or friend's dad that made you feel loved or wanted? Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uncles, cousins. My uncle is, I'm like his daughter and okay. he's like the father I didn't have, okay. that I didn't feel like I had. Um, but growing up, my uncle lived in Washington state. Um, so Ooh. now that he's on the East coast, he and I have gotten really close. Um, like I take him out for father's day, his birthday, all of that. Um, and because it is the experiences and the ties that bind us to each other. Correct. Correct. So because he remembers your childhood and he remembers whether it was talking about your birthday or your Easter speech yeah. or even if it was just on the telephone, yeah. you now have that attachment mm -hmm. to him, which Absolutely. is what I need a lot of people out there that are viewing this to pick up on. Yeah. You can't wait until, you know, they're 15, 16, 20 years old to and then pop in it. and say, yeah. you want the relationship with mm -hmm. them that you see them having with somebody else. Yeah. Or and I, to give my father credit, it, his popping in and out was like every year or so. Like, there was never a point I didn't know him, mm -hmm. um, but he wasn't as consistent as I wanted and needed. Um, whereas with my uncle, and when I look at it factually, yeah. my father and uncle were around the same amount of time. Mm -hmm. The difference is the expectation was different because you're okay. my father, you created me. Yeah. So the, because the expectations are different, like if my father was my uncle, mm -hmm. we probably would have had a great relationship because you don't <laughs> expect him to be there. Yeah, yeah. Now, tell me, let's talk about depression. Mm -hmm. At what point or at what age did you know what the term depression meant? College, when I was studying psychology. Okay. Absolutely. And you had a, you, did you have a moment where you looked back and thought, oh, that's what that was? Yes. Um, I mm. always felt that spirit. Okay. Couldn't really like put it into terms, mm -hmm. what was triggering it, how it was coming about or anything like that. And the moment that really opened my eyes in college, sophomore year, um, I had a breakup with the love of my life um, at that time. And I developed an eating disorder. And anyone who knows me, I eat. So when I stopped and I couldn't eat and I couldn't hold anything down mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I was feeling queasy and um, when I would try to eat, I couldn't keep eating yeah, and all of that. Yeah. And uh, a friend of mine was like, I really need you to see someone. And uh, I went to Virginia Tech in undergrad and we had free mental health counseling mm -hmm. available. So that was the first time I actually got the help that I needed. And that's when I started understanding the patterns. That's when I started understanding the triggers. Okay. And, um, and then once you understood it and you look back over your life from that point, mm -hmm. where do you think depression set in? Definitely set in Probably about five, six. Parents, I need you yeah. to hear yeah. what she's saying and what age that this all set in. Absolutely. Because we should not have eight, nine, and 10 year olds in our community committing suicide. Absolutely. And it breaks my heart. The reason it breaks my heart is because 
as an adult, we take their responsi we take the responsibility of their food and clothes and mm -hmm. shelter very mm -hmm. seriously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we minimize that responsibility that we have for their emotional development, for their healing, and understanding that children hurt too. Yes. There, there may not be logic to their pain, but they feel it. Mm -hmm. And so we have to stop minimizing that. We have to listen. And we in the Christian community have to do Girl. more than pray. Prayer works, but faith without works is dead. Mm -hmm. So we have to do our part and get these children the help that they deserve. For Five, sure. six. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. What would you say to a parent that currently has a five or six year old that they are telling, snap out of it, or go play with your friends, or didn't I buy you that doll baby you wanted, or, or uh, we'll take you to the church and pray for you, have uh, the pastor, the priest, or the imam pray over you mm -hmm. and then move on with life because this is done. What action would you tell them to take? Absolutely, child psychologist. And the reason I say that is first and foremost, it's available. Mm -hmm. um, most health insurances mm -hmm. will pay for it. Yes. It's not a legitimate barrier, mm -hmm. um, but they, they deserve to deal with that and honestly, a lot of emotional problems are genetic, so the parent probably has some stuff to work through as well, mm -hmm. and probably the grandparent and the grand <laughs> <laughs> But honestly and truly, like yes. we we need we as a black community mm. need to stop thinking that therapy is for crazy people. Mm -hmm. It's for everybody, and we're the last race to get on board. We really are. What if I told you? that you could stop the negative tape from playing inside your head. What if, with seven simple steps, you could leave the pain of the past behind and live every day as your true, authentic self? It is possible, and you can do it. The ebook, Seven Simple Steps to Beat Emotional Baggage, How to Become Whole, Healed, Healthy, and Happy, shares how to resolve emotional baggage and feel free to live true to your own personality, spirit, and character. Transform negative thinking into positive thinking and become equipped to boldly face your past and resolve emotional pain. Get your free copy at thatanitalive.com slash ebook. And we're back with Miss Nicole, sharing with us the details of her life story. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, which she's also shared in two books. Yes, yes. Let's get into, before I, I launch into the books. Yep. How long did the depression last? All my life. All, uh, up until maybe the last two, three years. Really? Yes. Um, it's been something I've dealt with. And even now, sometimes it creeps up. Mm -hmm. um, but it's always been a challenge mm -hmm. to get through. Um, I'm now creating processes in my life to avoid it. Um, but even still, so they're shorter and less frequent now, but okay. it, it still pops up every once in a while. Give me one of your processes that somebody else can easily replicate yeah. when they have those feelings. Absolutely. Journaling. Okay. I love journaling. Um, I will write 10, 15 pages if I have to, but it is a, a judgment-free zone mm -hmm. and it is an unbiased space to just get it out. Um, exercising regularly, A, it builds your self-confidence because of your physical results, but also it's a great way to release everything that you're feeling. Uh, therapy, when I was in my darkest moments following the miscarriage, I was in therapy every week, like clockwork. Yeah. Um, vacationing alone, it gives you time to reset. Yes. It gives you time to breathe. Yes, tell it, yes. tell it. <laughs> Just this month, actually, I, um, I booked a hotel in ba downtown Baltimore. Just one night. Mm -hmm. It was the best money I've ever spent because it was, I slept for 14 hours and took a three-hour nap. Like sometimes you just need a pause button. Sometimes you need to be able to just be and just exist. Mm -hmm. And um, so those are definitely some of my go-tos. 
and definitely having the right people around you. Okay. The people who are gonna allow you to feel it, but not stay there. Yeah, there was one assignment that I had, and when it ended, I slept for three days straight. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And that, the only reason I woke up when I did was because my phone rang. <laughs> <laughs> because I was just that, and it wasn't so much that I was physically tired. Once it ended and I knew it was over, then mm -hmm. it was like my body did this release. Yeah, yeah. If we don't give our bodies the rest that it needs, mm -hmm. it will take it. And so I definitely, one day a week, I do absolutely nothing out of obligation. I still get some work done and things like that. I was going like, to say, I don't see how because Instagram, Facebook, two books written. Number three is on the way. I workshops mean, that you hold. It's time management, okay. but I take my, my day of rest seriously. Mm -hmm. So even if I am working, I got my feet up. I'm in my comfortable clothes. Okay. You know, but I'm, and I only work on projects that I enjoy, that I'm excited yeah. about, yeah. that I love. I don't do anything out of obligation. And typically that day is Sunday. That's my day to reset. Mm -hmm. It's my day for me. I will turn my phone off if I have to. Mm -hmm. I will put mm -hmm. it on airplane mode without a second thought. Mm -hmm. um, and although I'm very active on social media, I also have limits with that as well. Okay. Because I don't want the facade of social media to interfere with my real life. Um, so I cannot, my phone is set up so that I cannot be on social media from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Okay. That gives me a chance to shut down at night mm -hmm. and get my day started on my terms yes. before I see what anything else is going on in the world. <laughs> Say that again. I, I have to. I determine <laughs> how my day is going to be mm -hmm. before I go see how everybody else's day is going. And you can set your phone. Absolutely. It's in, a setting. In what way? Um, so just it's called screen time on iPhone. I, I don't right. know Android. I'm sorry. <laughs> but under iPhone, there's a screen time mm -hmm. setting and I have it no more than two hours in a day. Mm -hmm. So if I have a really heavy social media day, my phone will shut it down. And I'm like, all right, well, reached my limit. <laughs> <laughs> because there's nothing on social media that is that necessary. It's an important part of my business mm -hmm. and I enjoy it and mm -hmm. I love it, but I also have to put parameters around it so it doesn't, imp it doesn't control my life. Now, talk to me about the miscarriage. Absolutely. The, uh, the, 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 put me in the day that it happened. How did that day unfold mm -hmm. for you? So it actually is a two-part story. I lost my twins three weeks apart. Whoa. Yeah. Um, my 25th birthday, I went to a doctor's appointment, excited I get to see my babies. And, um, you know, in my stature, I, I hadn't been putting on a lot of weight. And I'm carrying twins, so you kind of expect yes. to put on a lot uh -huh. of weight. Because um, I was about five months pregnant on my 25th birthday. And, I, you know, I told the doctor, I said, you know, I just want to make sure everything's okay. Like, I'm not gaining weight a lot. Mm -hmm. And she's like, oh, it's your first pregnancy. Oh, you're small. Like, oh, it's okay. And then she starts looking, and she's like, we got to get you to a specialist. Can you go? Like, I drove to, like, Rockville or something like that. She was like, I have a, a specialist. We're going to have you seen, like, right now. Mind you, I'm alone. Mm -hmm. The father of my babies was at work. Because I'm like, it's just a regular appointment. Right. It's okay. Mm -hmm. um, my mom had slept in because she had a red eye from Vegas that she just landed that morning. My grandmother, she was, she was available, but, like, it would have required me stopping to go get her to then go to Rockville. Yeah. So I'm like... Okay, but most importantly, I'm trying not to miss this appointment. Cause she's like, go right, go now. right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, so I, I'm calling, you know, my family, I'm like, hey, they have concerns. I'm heading up this way, I'll let you know. Okay. And my grandma's like, do you wanna come pick me up? I was like, I don't wanna miss the appointment time, you know, like, right. blah, blah, blah. Cause at this point, my grandmother, she just doesn't drive. Um, Cause- In traffic in the DC area, it's exactly. crazy. And it's so. a lot. So, um, so I was like, okay, I'll go. I'll call everybody, you know, blah, blah, blah. I get to the specialist and she starts, you know, doing the pictures and taking pictures and getting the heartbeat. And she's like, baby A and taking pictures and then baby B and then taking pictures. And then she goes back to baby A. And I said, um, so I heard baby A's heartbeat. She's like, okay, that sounds good. And, and I looked at her and I said, well, what about baby B? And she was just like, <laughs> and I knew. Mm -hmm. Like my heart broke in that moment, realizing that my son was dead. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and then even more so, the first miscarriage 
they had concerns about the amount of brain fluid in my remaining baby. And so then I had to get MRIs and they took samples of the embryonic fluid and okay. every test you could possibly imagine over the course of two, three weeks. And after the MRI, they determined that the amount of damage was simply too much. Um, he would have essentially had, to, he would have needed brain surgery within a week of living mm -hmm. and lung surgery within a year of living. And numerous tests, and this is all if he survived the pregnancy, right. uh, not being able to walk for the rest of his life, difficulties processing visual stimuli, um, needing to be in a wheelchair, 24 hour care. And I just could not bring my son into the world knowing he would hurt for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. um, so I decided to deliver both of the twins, um, did a full delivery, got to hold you know, the, the older twin and um, I shared that experience with my mother in, you know, getting to, to hold him. And I, I still hear his last breath in my ear wow. to this day. And it's almost three years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you shared that very yeah. explicitly in your book. Yes. And uh, When Life Gives You Lemons, I talk about the details of it because it's it was the worst. Like, that was the worst thing I had ever experienced. Um, aside from the depression, aside from the suicide, the daddy issues, the low self-esteem, mm -hmm. that was the lowest I had ever been because I had to learn how to breathe again. Because of what the, the emptiness that you felt because yeah. of the loss. Absolutely. So Absolutely. now tell me how you turned that, as you say, yeah. that lemon into... Um, when I walked away from my twins in that hospital, I made a conscious decision that I would spend the rest of my life creating a life that they would be proud of. Okay. And so I didn't know what that looked like at that time. I didn't know what that meant. Right. Um, but I knew that there had to be a reason for it. Like there has to be some reason yeah. that for me to always have wanted children and my first experience to end the way that it did, mm. um, there had to have been some cause bigger than myself. And I was determined to figure out what that was. Yeah. And since then, I have, you know, launched my business, Nicole's Network. Mm -hmm. I actually just recently launched a nonprofit specific to the grief of miscarriage. Mm -hmm. And not only for the mothers, but for the father of that baby, for the grandparents of that baby, the siblings, aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody impacted by the loss of a baby. So how do you help everybody that's impacted? Yes. Um, I do offer um, development coaching. Okay. So one-on-one -on -one guidance and support, mm -hmm. uh, whether you need that for your struggles with depression and your personal struggles, or whether you need that for surviving the grief of a miscarriage. Um, and then I also offer, uh, I have a video blog. Every Monday I'm posting a Motivational Monday. Mm -hmm. um, I'm constantly trying to come up with content that I think is impactful mm -hmm. and helpful and sparking the conversation. Um, I definitely have my books. Um, and 23 and finally loving me and when life gives you lemons and I think both of them speak to how do you deal with it like how do you get through it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and sometimes we just need someone who's brave enough to be consistent and transparent so that you can sit there and say you know me too like we all need this this permission to be vulnerable. Yeah. And I, I make a conscious effort every single day to do so. And definitely through my motivational speaking engagements, um, consistently going out there and just being vulnerable myself mm -hmm. and putting my story out there mm -hmm. so that others feel comfortable sharing theirs. Yeah. Um, because it always takes one brave soul absolutely. to step out there first. And I've taken that as my duty. And then everybody else would yeah. then say, as this latest movement that we have Me going too. on. Right, mm -hmm. but in silence, Everybody suffered. Absolutely. And so I've made the commitment to be that brave soul. Okay. Um, and that is something that I, I attribute to my need to find purpose for that pain. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people's pains come from not being heard. So when I'm having these encounters with individuals or when I go to a speaking engagement and people say, I lost a baby too. Mm -hmm. I sit there and listen. Because a lot of times we're just waiting for someone to 
care enough to listen. To take the time to actually, and what you say when you say listen and not just hear. Absolutely. Because there's a difference. Because there's a very big difference. And so, you know, it's every day just one step at a time and just working towards just being the best version of myself and also creating a opportunity for my, I have a little sister and I have eight nieces and nephews. Woo. The oldest is eight or seven, I'm sorry. So first of all, my family's busy. <laughs> Obviously. First of all, <laughs> they're very busy. Um, but it is my honor and my duty to make sure that I am setting the best example of black girl magic for them. When life gives you lemons mm -hmm. and a memoir. 23 and finally loving 23 me. 23 and finally loving me. Yep. If, I, if you had to pick one, mm -hmm. which is your favorite? Oh my goodness. Mm. Um, if I had to pick, I would say the first one was my favorite because in that moment I found me and I found the strength to be honest and truthful and I found a resilience to be able to say, regardless of what I go through, mm -hmm. I deserve to tell my story. Now, it's any particular reason that the lady on this cover is in blue and gold? Absolutely. And what is that? <laughs> <laughs> but and of what course. Is the reason for that? I am a proud member of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, and I love to find any opportunity to incorporate <laughs> blue and gold. And when you told me the background was blue, I was like, Because <laughs> you came in dressed in all blue today, Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, without a second thought. Um, so thank you for the heads up. <laughs> but I definitely would have, for sure. Since launching Nicole's network in 2016, she has found fulfillment in sharing her story in the hopes of helping others. Nicole is open, as you can see, very. She's very open, transparent, and committed to helping others with their personal development. In 2019, she launched her nonprofit, Life After Loss, aimed at serving the one in four women who will suffer the loss of an infant. To reach out to Nicole, find her on Instagram at Nicole's Network. I'm Anita, your host. Be sure to check out thatanitalive.com for where and when to see our next episode. Thank <laughs> you.